covered in clouds that reflect a lot of sunlight back to us. So that's why it appears so bright in the sky. So in the evening, if you see a really bright object in the west, northwestern sky that kind of looks like an airplane with its landing lights on, that is the planet Venus. So that is the only planet that we can see tonight at 9.30. Uh, and another thing I wanted to point out before we start looking at some other objects in the sky is that uh, I do have a location here set to Youngstown. Uh, but if you're not in Youngstown and you happen to download Solarium, you can set it to any location and see what the sky will look like wherever you are. Uh, but this is set to Youngstown. And if you are in the middle of Youngstown and you look up the sky, you won't see this many stars. Uh, we have a problem called light pollution. Uh, lights from cars and streetlights and headlights shine up and wash out the stars in the night sky and make it difficult to see some of the stars so you can only see the brighter objects in our sky. So we'll mostly be focusing on those. Um, if you get out of the city into a more rural area, maybe from your house if you live not near a major city, you'll see more stars. But uh, I did point out with these cardinal directions, uh, I told you where to look, but you don't have these cardinal directions in the real nighttime sky. You don't have big red letters telling you where to look. Um, so there's a really easy way to figure out which direction you're facing using patterns in the night sky. So the easiest way to figure out which direction you're facing is to look for a group of seven stars that make the shape of a big spoon in the sky. We can see it right now, right here. This pattern here is the Big Dipper. So we can use the Big Dipper to figure out which direction we're facing. And it's very easy to spot in the sky. And it's in the sky where we live in Youngstown. It's in the sky all year. So we can see it all the time. So it's a really uh, good tool for unlocking the night sky. So I'm going to show you just the outline of the Big Dipper so you can see it more clearly. And we've got another outline up there. We'll get rid of that. Uh, so here is the Big Dipper. And as you can see, we have these other lines going on here. That's because the Big Dipper is part of the constellation Ursa Major, or the Big Bear. The Big Dipper itself actually isn't a constellation. It's what we call an asterism. So constellations are very formal. They're used by astronomers to map out the night sky. There are 88 official constellations, most of which come from uh, Greek mythology. And just like the United States is divided into uh, boundaries of the states, the sky is divided into boundaries. So if you're looking for a certain location, uh, maybe here on Earth, you'd say it's located in this state. Well, if astronomers are looking for a certain object in the sky, we say it's in that constellation. So that's why there are formal constellations, but anything that's not a constellation like the Big Dipper is just called an asterism. So once Alini, you've found- Sorry, uh, but in, uh, people question. are saying they can't see your uh, pointer well on the screen. It's too dark. Uh, I do not know how to change that quickly. <laughs> I'm sorry. Does anyone know? Uh, Maybe Dr. Jarrell, you have a Mac. Is there maybe a shortcut or something I could that I can make it bigger or brighter? I don't know. Thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, while we're waiting, uh, we did have a comment. Someone would like to see the Lyriads if you planned on having that somewhere in your star talk. Just uh, I can do that quickly at the end. Yes. Very good. Okay, yep. Uh, so let's see. Okay. Uh, I have to give it permission to Okay. All right. Let's go back to Solarium. Okay. So once you found the Big Dipper, uh, you can find these two bright stars here on the front end of the cup and trace a line from the bottom through the top and you will find this bright star here. 
this is Polaris or the North Star. This star will always point you exactly north. So as you can see, Polaris is right above north here. So once you find that, you know you're facing north. You don't need your big red letters. You know that east is to your right, west is to your left, and south is behind you. So again, there's Polaris, uh, and Polaris is in the constellation Ursa Minor, which you might also know as the Little Dipper. You can see outlined here. Uh, the Little Dipper is made of very faint stars. These two here on the front edge of the cup are the brightest stars that you might be able to see if you don't have a lot of light pollution in your area. But if you can see the full Little Dipper, then you know that you're in a really good place to look at the stars. Uh, but Polaris is very bright and easy to see. So uh, you'll never, you shouldn't have a problem seeing that if you can see the Big Dipper. So the reason why uh, we use these stars, specifically, like I said earlier, uh, we call these circumpolar stars because they're up all year. Uh, that just means, circum means around. So they move around in polar, like Polaris or the pole. Uh, the reason Polaris appears stationary in the sky as, the time, as time goes on and the stars appear to move around it is because if you were to draw an imaginary line through the North Pole and extend it all the way out, uh, it would reach out to Polaris. So as the Earth rotates around this imaginary line, which we call its axis, uh, Polaris doesn't move and all the other stars do. So we can take a look at that. I'm going to move ahead in time here. So this is going to be what it looks like uh, as time goes on, if you could speed up time and look at the night sky. So as you can see, the stars here are moving around Polaris. And now it is about 11, 11.30. Uh, and we are going to start looking over into our eastern sky because some things have gotten higher in the sky over here that are a little more interesting. So going back to our Big Dipper, we can use the Big Dipper to find some other constellations in the sky. So if you trace the handle of the Big Dipper, it kind of makes an arc shape. You can extend that out and arc to this bright star right here. We call that star Arcturus. So you can arc to Arcturus. That's a good way to remember what to do there. And Arcturus is the brightest, constel the brightest star in the constellation Bootes or Booties, however you prefer to pronounce it, the herdsman. Uh, so I don't know how to draw a herdsman. That doesn't really look like a herdsman to me. But the cool thing about the constellations is it doesn't matter how you see them. You can draw them however you want. So some people kind of see Bootes as a kite shape. So this would be like the main part of the kite and it's got two little tails coming off of it. I prefer to see it as an ice cream cone. So if you trace these three stars, so Arcturus is the point of the cone, and these three stars here, make the shape of the cone. And then you have a scoop of ice cream on top. Well, when I eat ice cream, I prefer to have more than one scoop. There is another scoop over here. It fell off. That's actually another constellation. That is Corona Borealis or the Northern Crown. Uh, these stars are pretty dim, but they do make a very distinct crown shape. So once you've found Bootes, you can find Corona Borealis pretty easily right next to it. Now the last constellation I want to show you is one that we don't normally talk about. It's pretty dim uh, if you're looking at it in the real night sky. It looks a little bit brighter on Stellarium uh, since we're simulating the night sky. Uh, but that constellation is Hercules. So to find Hercules, the easiest way to find Hercules is if you're looking uh, right next to Bootes and you follow Corona Borealis, you'll come to these four stars here. Uh, we call this the Keystone of Hercules. So these are the brightest stars in the constellation Hercules. But if we put up the outline here, uh, this 
is his body. The keystone is his body. He's got his arms above his head. So this is the top half of his body and his legs down here. So why am I pointing out this constellation if it's not easy to see in the sky? Well, later, uh, Howard and Dr. Jarrell are going to be telling you about certain objects that, uh, that exist uh, in the universe. And if you have a telescope and you find Hercules you, and you look between these two stars, this would be uh, the side of Hercules' body or the side of the keystone and look through your telescope, you'll find this object here. This is a globular cluster. So this is M13 or the Hercules globular cluster. And uh, later on, Howard and Dr. Jarrell are going to tell you a little bit more about these objects. So if you, if you do have a telescope, I encourage you to go out and look at this but I don't want to spoil anything for you. So that's all I'm going to tell you about those. There's one last thing I wanted to show you in the sky. That is, uh, I know I mentioned that Venus was the only planet that you can see in the sky around 930. But if you happen to get up very early in the morning and just before the sun rises, if you look into the east southeastern sky, you can see three more planets. So we are going to go ahead and watch the sunrise here and look out for these planets. So right now it's about uh, it's about 4 a.m. This is about 5:30, about six in the morning. You can see Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars all in a line just before sunrise. So if you are a morning person, uh, you can go outside and see these three planets rising up in the southeastern sky. So that's all I have to show you in the sky, but there is one more thing that I wanted to show you guys. So I'm going to close out of Solarium. Oh, the lady wanted to see the Lyrians or oh, the location. I forgot. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Sure. I'm so sorry. Okay. So uh, we are going to go back to around 9.30 p.m. Real quick. Oop, too far. All right. So this is about almost 10 p.m. And... Uh, we can search. Uh, Tiffany, how do I make the buttons come back <laughs> so I can search? Because I don't know where the lyrics are, but I can. You hit them. the same again. It's the command T, I believe. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, we in, in the meantime, we had a, a really interesting question. It was answered in the comments, but I just wanted to say it out loud because I thought it was really interesting. Are there any stars that we see with our unaided eyes that are actually galaxies that appear to be stars just because they're really far away? Or are galaxies only visible through telescopes? Do you want to answer? It was answered in the comments, but. Okay, so was the, sorry, the question was, are there any galaxies that are visible in the nighttime sky? With the unaided eye, yes. The unaided eye. So if you go to a place with very, very little light pollution, uh, there is a galaxy that is visible. I've never seen it. Um, it kind of just looks like a faint fuzzy cloud if you look at it just with your eyes, but that is the Andromeda galaxy. It's the closest galaxy to us. Uh, and since our show is about galaxies and galaxy types, it is a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way, um, but it is, it's much bigger. Uh, and you can see it in the constellation Andromeda, which I don't believe is up right now. Yeah, unfortunately, Andromeda is right next to the sun right now, so it's just a real bad time to see it. But the best <laughs> time to see it is during the fall. Uh, and if you have dark skies, you can see it. I've seen it myself, and it's, it's really cool knowing that you're seeing a galaxy that's two million light years away. So the light that's entering your eyes left that galaxy 
two million years ago. So cool. Elaine, <laughs> awesome. would you like me to say talk a little bit about the Lyriad shower? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, it's not too much of a major shower. You only see about 10 to 15 meteors per hour with it. So it, that means one about every two or three minutes, uh, what it boils down to. Um, if we didn't have all these clouds, the best time to see it would be go out after midnight. When you do that, you're turned, you know, the earth is turned into the stream of meteors. So there are more between midnight and dawn. And meteor showers are awesome because you don't need any special tools to see them. Matter of fact, the human eye is best at picking up motion. So you just get a feel like what you're seeing on uh, the screen here, a very dark sky with a wide open horizon and just slowly scan your eyes back across the sky. Where you see uh, the Lyrids marked on the chart here, it's near in the constellation Lyra, which is near the bright star Vega. They look like they might come out of that section of the sky, but they can be anywhere in the sky. You scan it and you'll start seeing these little streaks across the sky as you watch them. So uh, there are many major showers throughout the year. Uh, the Lyrids isn't the biggest one, but it is one of our few spring ones. So there you go. Thank you, Kurt. All right, there's one last thing I want to show you guys real quick. Uh, so I am going to minimize Solarium right now. So this is something that you can see. Maybe I can. There we go. Uh, this is something that you'll be able to see soon here. So this is what we call a satellite constellation. That's just a group of satellites that work together and it's not going full screen. Please go full screen. There we go. All right, anyway, I'll just leave it like that. Now we're getting an advertisement. Sorry guys, technical difficulties. <laughs> There we go. Okay. So, uh, like I mentioned, this is what we call a satellite constellation. It's a group of satellites that all work together. And uh, you may have seen these already and wondered what the heck you were looking at. Uh, but these are, this is just a chain of low Earth orbit satellites launched by the company SpaceX. Uh, they started launching them a few weeks ago and plan to have thousands of them in orbit. And by uh, 2021 or 2022, these satellites will be providing uh, global satellite internet. Uh, and you can see up to 60 of them in a chain. They are launched in groups of 60. But the reason I wanted to show you guys these is because you can see them uh, Monday evening and Tuesday evening, Monday evening at 8.59 p.m., you can see a group of about 20, and Tuesday evening at 8.41 p.m. and 9.12 p.m., uh, you can see groups of 15 and 20. So this website that I'm showing you now, um, this is a really cool resource. It's linked down in the comments. It's, uh, it's got hundreds of satellites, and what you do is you enter your location, and it tells you when and where to look for these satellites. It's paired with Google Maps, Google Street View. Um, and if you put in your location, you can click this little button here, uh, see where it will appear in your sky. So I have our location set to the planetarium right now. So you see there's Ward Beecher Hall, there's the planetarium. And it shows you exactly where to look in your sky to see these satellites. Uh, and again, this doesn't just have Starlink, but we also it also has hundreds of different satellites. So if you like to look up and see these things, uh, then this is a really great resource. And again, it'll be linked down in the comments. If you want to see things other than Starlink, you just go over here on the left and scroll down. And there's a little button here, to check out all of the other satellites you can see. All right, so that is all I have to you, uh, have for you. I'm going to hand it back over to Tiffany to introduce our next speaker. So I'm going to stop screen sharing. All right, uh, thank you, Eleni. Wonderful job as always. Um, so our next speaker is Howard, another one of our students, uh, a senior of ours. He'll be leaving us 
soon, uh, but he's going to talk a little bit about um, galaxies and galaxy types and touch on some of the research that he does here at, uh, at YSU as, um, as an undergrad. Howard? Hello, can you hear me well? You sound great. Okay. So as Tiffany mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, galaxies, the different types that you could see. And I'm also going to shamelessly plug a little bit of research I do here at YSU. So I'm going to share my screen. Pull up a little PowerPoint I made for everyone. Get us started. Okay. Hopefully everything looks good. Is this box in the way? Okay, so hopefully y'all can see my cursor, but these are the different galaxy types. And this is a diagram. It's known as the Hubble tuning fork. Uh, and I also wanna point out in this diagram, what you're seeing are different galaxy types. So over here on the left, we have elliptical galaxies and they're numbered from zero to seven. And that number indicates how elliptical it is. So E0 being the most spherical, the most round, all the way to E7 being the most elliptical. And uh, these shapes doesn't indicate age or anything. And all on the right, we have our spiral galaxies over here. So up top, we have our regular spirals. They're given the uh, SA category. And on the bottom here, we have SBs for S barred. So these are barred spirals. and these two things here, right up before ellipticals and spirals, are called lenticulars. Uh, these are objects. There are types of galaxies that have the nuclei that we see in spiral galaxies without the arms. So that's an interesting object all in itself. And then in the middle here, we have intermediate galaxies. And these are just spiral, intermediate spiral galaxies. And they're just the same as the spirals we see here, but they might have some extra gas or dust that might be distorting the shape of it. And on the end here, we have irregular galaxies. These are galaxies that don't really have much of a shape with them. And they can be in all types of random configurations. And way on the end here, it's really small. So it might be hard for you all to see, but uh, we have dwarf galaxies. And these are all the different types of galaxies. And these are just a few of the classifications. Sometimes you might get galaxies that might fit in one or two of the classifications. But uh, none of these indicate age. So it doesn't start as elliptical and go to spirals. In the sense, actually, ellipticals are actually older than most of the spirals. And I'll talk more about that later on in the talk. But to get us started, I have an image of, elliptical ga of a spiral galaxy. Uh, I believe this is M83, the Pinwheel Galaxy. And as you can see in this galaxy, it has a lot of color. You can see the spirals coming off from the center. And there's these blue regions within the galaxy, a lot of color in it. And that indicates that these are star forming regions. Just like in our Milky Way, we have a lot of this uh, gas and dust within the spiral. And those is where stars are being formed which is something you don't normally see in the galaxy. This is an example of a barred spiral. And just like our Milky Way, our Milky Way is a barred galaxy as well. Lots of gas and dust to suggest that this galaxy is still having stars being formed within it. This is an example of an elliptical galaxy. As you can see you, see, you still see some faint gas, maybe some dust here, but it doesn't have any of the spirals. And it's pretty orange in color. That's because a lot of the stars in this galaxy are older. And there isn't much star forming going on, not a lot of young stars. Like you might be lucky to find a few. 
but a lot of the stars in elliptical galaxies are tend to be on the older side. And this is an example of another elliptical galaxy. This one is more spherical. And I believe this is M87. You might've heard about it in the news before. It was a galaxy we imaged a black hole of. So that's just another example of an elliptical galaxy. And you notice it's more spherical than the one before it, which was more elliptical in shape. And that's because elliptical galaxies can come in those different numbers we saw from E0 all the way to E7. Have a great question, Howard. Somebody yes. was asking how many galaxies are there? There's actually a large number of galaxies. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but um, galaxies are actually pretty common. Towards the end of my talk, I'll show you an image that actually contains a cluster of galaxies because just like you might see clusters of stars, you can also see clusters of galaxies because those are just, there's just that many galaxies just in the universe. So I guess to answer the question, it's just a lot of galaxies. This is an example of one of the irregular galaxies I was talking about. I forget the name off the top of my head, but I do know that this one is supposed to be in the constellation Leo the Lion. And unlike what we saw in spirals, which had the distinct shapes of that spiral shape, whether it had a bar or not, and just like ellipticals, which had either that ellipse shape or either a spherical shape, irregular galaxies just kind of have no distinct shape. As you see, this one kind of does this little hook with gas and dust. But irregular galaxies, although they might not have a distinct shape, they still have these bright regions where stars will be formed. And there's a lot of guesses to the shape of these galaxies. For example, they could have been galaxies that in early formation might have had something come in contact with it that distorted its shape. Or they could have been spiral galaxies or other galaxies that got ripped apart and galaxy interactions. There's a lot of theories for it and a lot of theories for the formation of galaxies, even just spirals and elliptical themselves. This is another example of an irregular galaxy. The image is not as good, but you can see this one just kind of just streaks across the sky. No real distinct shape. And you see there's still some bright star forming regions. And after irregulars, this gets closer to more of the topic of my research. Not exactly, but it touches the surface of it, which are dwarf galaxies. So these are galaxies. They're more on the irregular path and classification, but they're different than irregular galaxies in the sense that like they're really small. They're a lot smaller. A lot of dwarf, dwarf galaxies contain about 100 million to a few billion stars, which in the grand scheme of things, it sounds like a lot of stars. But if you compare that to our Milky Way, which has 200 billion to 400 billion stars, that's a lot more stars compared to a dwarf galaxy. So in the grand scheme of things, dwarf, dwarf galaxies are just really small galaxies with relatively few stellar populations. And to put even things in perspective, here's another picture of a dwarf galaxy. This one is even fainter than the one before it. I believe this one is called Sculptor. And in case you're having a hard time seeing it, it's this little faint buzz in the middle here of the image. Might be hard to tell. It's hard to tell these in the sky as well. It takes a lot of deep fields and long exposures to really pick up these dwarf galaxies because they're just so faint. You have to go like real deep into observations when observing the sky. And if you were to take, say, a dwarf galaxy like this, that's more spread out and take its stellar population. So let's say you got the same amount of stars but instead of having it spread out amongst the sky, you kind of put it more towards a more small area. That's when you get a new type of object, which has only been studied in the, since the 2000s. So it's really new. Like these are new objects being found, but they're called UCDs or ultra compact dwarfs. 
And what that is is just a dwarf galaxy that's really compact. So it might it has about the same stellar population that we see with dwarf galaxies, but it does it's a lot smaller. And as you can see here, on the left we have an image of M59, which as you can see is an elliptical galaxy. And then way down here, we have one of those ultra compact dwarf galaxies. So it looks like a star just here in the image, but when you zoom in on it, you see that little faint haze of gas and dust that you would see in a galaxy. And that's what lets astronomers believe that this might be some other than a star. They're real easy to miss because of their, their um, misleading looks, their apparent looks. But there's a lot of ways to find them. My research actually deals with actually finding UCB candidates and making that distinction between is this a UCB, a ultra compact dwarf, or just a regular galaxy that's really far away, or a star that got mistaken to be an ultra compact dwarf. And the reason they're so luminous is because of the fact that, like I mentioned with the dwarf galaxies, which are more spread out, these are more compact. So it has that same stellar population, but when you scrunch it down and put it into a more small area, you get a more luminous object. So it looks a lot brighter because the stars are more closer together. On the right, we have another one. This is M85, another galaxy, large galaxy. And here we have another ultra compact dwarf. Looks like a star. It's, it's a lot fainter than the one on the left. But when you zoom in, you still see that faint haze of gas kind of around the object. So it's real, it's real easy to miss these objects. And it takes a lot of deep sky surveys. And these are usually found in large at the core of galaxy clusters. Because you can have a cluster of galaxies, such as this one, which is the Perseus cluster. And what you're seeing in this image is a large cluster of galaxies just across the image. So my research deals with looking at images taken by an astronomer here at YSU, Dr. Darrell. He uh, worked with a few of his uh, partners and they took uh, images. They looked at images from this cluster and I'm looking at images. So they had images at the center where they found a lot of ultra compact dwarf candidates because ultra compact dwarves are usually found at the center of these clusters. But my research deals with looking further away. So kind of here in the outfield, because what we want to see is, can you find ultra compact dwarves away from the, this, the core of the uh, galaxy cluster, or can you only find them at the core of the galaxy cluster, such as this, which is the Perseus cluster. So in my research, I look at the images that are way out so there's not much in the images I'm looking at. I see a few galaxies here and there in my images that I observe. But I um, just look out there and I see if I can find just candidates for ultra compact dwarfs. And then after doing a lot of analysis, I make that distinction between, okay, this is an actual UCD candidate or it's just a regular main sequence star that we see in the Milky Way or it's just a galaxy that's really far away and it makes it look like an ultra compact dwarf. So that's just some of the work I'm doing here at YSU. And that's just a little bit about the different galaxies we have. And even in this image, you can see just the different types of galaxies that I talked about. You see a couple of spirals, a couple of ellipticals, all in just this large cluster. And, you, and galaxy clusters are pretty common. They're not all that rare. This is just a Perseus cluster. Even the Milky Way itself is even kind of in its own galaxy cluster. But another thing about UCDs I didn't mention is that uh, UCDs, a way, an easy way to find them is to kind of make the distinction when looking at the brightness of them because UCDs are actually brighter than these objects called globular clusters, which are star clusters. That uh, Lainey mentioned earlier in her star talk, she brought up a star, a globular cluster M13. And UCDs, ultra compact dwarfs, are actually brighter than those but they're still fainter than the stars in the Milky Way. 
So the, usually when looking at the brightness of ultra compact dwarfs, one easy way to tell if what you're looking at is even a candidate is if it's brighter than the globular cluster and fainter than the Milky Way stars. And to tell you more about globular clusters, as I mentioned, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Darrell. But before I do that, I wanna know if there's any questions that people might have in the comments because I haven't been able to read your comments since I started talking. Yeah, so, hi. Um, that's great. You actually answered one, Matthew asked, how can you tell the difference between an ultra compact dwarf and a very bright star? Mm -hmm. and, and as you mentioned, it's, it li its brightness lies somewhere between a globular cluster and a bright star in the Milky Way. Um, another question was from Stephanie, uh, who names all these galaxies and what kinds of telescopes are being used to take these pictures? I just got to be, uh, so as far as who names the galaxies, I know a lot of the, um, such so as the uh, naming scheme comes just based off um, catalogs and just the astronomy community, like they'll get a, a letter and a number because there's just so many galaxies out there, all of them can't have their own individual name. And it's easier to catalog them when they go based off of like a numbering scheme such as, um, for example, the Pinwheel Galaxy is M83. I know the Bard Spiral I showed was called NGC 1300. But even then, such galaxies like M83 have nicknames as the Pinwheel Galaxy, and those are usually either given by the astronomer that discovered it. In some cases, they'll give it a nickname. In other cases, it's just a galaxy they found. They'll just add it to the catalog based off of the letters and numbers scheme. And um, I forget the second part of the question. Oh, uh, who takes, let's take these images. So um, in the Perseus cluster and in the images I'm looking at for my research, the uh, object, the uh, tool used for taking the images was the Hubble Space Telescope. So when I'm, the images I look at for my research are all taken, they're all images taken by the Hubble Telescope from Dr. Darrell and all his colleagues. And I know, um, there's other telescopes as well that take some images of galaxies, but the main one I know of is Hubble. Well, thank you, Howard. Uh, I just want to uh, mention everyone. Um, Howard is a, a senior here, and you know, he's been working at the planetarium um, since August 21st, 2017. I know the exact date for two reasons. One, <laughs> it's his birthday. <laughs> It was his birthday that day, and it was also the date of the Great American Solar Eclipse, so we were all looking up that day. And Howard spent the whole day in a huge field at Campfield Experimental Farms with us, uh, sharing telescopes and showing people the moon crossing the sun. And he's been a wonderful educator um, and communicator with the public at the Planetarium ever since. So uh, he's graduating next week, and we're really going to miss you, Howard. I'm going to miss everybody, too. <laughs> Thank you for sharing a little bit of your research. Um, and so we're going to hand this off to Dr. Durrell now. He's going to teach us a little bit about these globular clusters. Oh, good day, everybody. Yes. Uh, thanks to uh, Delaney and Howard for setting things up so nicely. Uh, and I'm going to talk uh, just briefly. Uh, about a topic that's near and dear to my heart because I've been studying these things for well over 30 years. Um, and these are globular clusters. Uh, these are massive star clusters that usually live in the outskirts of other galaxies. So they have lots of stars in them, but they're not galaxy size. So these things are a little bit smaller and a little bit less luminous uh, than what Howard was talking about but we have lots of beautiful examples around the Milky Way, uh, including this image that I wanted to start off. It's a good example of a globular cluster. It's called M54. And basically what a globular cluster is, is think of a few hundred thousand stars, all centrally concentrated. Gravity keeps them in more or less a round shape. And it's one of the few areas in the galaxy where in the very middle, the stars are pretty close to one another. Once a, and once in a while, they can actually run into one another. Uh, don't worry, where we live in the Milky Way, it's nothing like that. 
But these are often these very beautiful objects. This one is very similar to M13, which Eleni showed you a little earlier, uh, you know, right off the keystone of the constellation of Hercules. Uh, she pointed that one out because it's one of the best ones to go after if you have access to a small telescope where you might have a chance of seeing the fuzziness of the cluster and maybe some of the stars on the outskirts that you can see clearly. Many of the images I'm going to show you from the Hubble Space Telescope, but not all. But there's a reason we study these things. They're very, very interesting objects. Uh, again, this is just another one. Uh, you can actually see some of the red giant stars. There's a few of those that are in a typical one of these globular clusters. So a nice color image almost looks like a jewel box uh, in, in many, many ways. So again, think of the area of, you know, the going from side to side for a cluster like this is probably 100 light years at most. So these are actually more compact than the ultra compact dwarfs that Howard was talking about and a little less luminosity. So they are quite compact in the middle. But again, from, uh, from our vantage point using the Hubble telescope, we can actually uh, use high resolution to look deep inside the middle and study these things in details that we weren't able to do before. Now, they come in a variety of sizes. They're not all the same. There are some globular clusters that only have a few thousand stars and, and they don't look like much. And then we have this one. This is sort of the, uh, uh, the big one in the Milky Way. It actually has the name of a star because when people first discovered it, they thought it was a star to the naked eye, but through a telescope, it's a giant globular cluster called Omega Centauri. And this object has anywhere from five to 10 million stars in it. So this is, in itself is a rather large globular cluster. And again, any little dot you can see in this image is a star not terribly different from our own sun. So imagine, you know, five million suns all in a small area of space. Now, one of the reasons we like to study them is because these, these uh, star clusters are sort of like, uh, you know, the granddaddies of, of the galaxy. These are old clusters, okay? By understanding uh, astrophysics and stellar evolution, these star clusters are among the first things to form in a galaxy. So they've seen it all. Uh, they are typically anywhere from 11 to 13 billion years old, at least most of them are. And as a result, they formed first. So by astronomers studying these things, we get sort of an idea of what the early conditions were like in the early universe when galaxies were just starting to be born. Okay, so whether it's a big one like Omega Centauri or a small one uh, that has, you know, far, far fewer stars, we learn a lot about how galaxies form, the galaxies that these things live around. Now, one neat thing is because they're so small and they're so dense, one of the questions it's fair to ask is, what would it be like if you could actually be inside one of these globular clusters? Well, the sky would be rather different from what you're used to seeing, okay? Even if you get out to a dark site and look at the sky, you might see a few thousand stars if you're really lucky. Uh, but if you were to live on a planet around a star near the center of a globular cluster, the sky would look a lot more like this. Uh, this is actually a simulation run by a couple of astronomers, uh, Jeremy Webb and Bill Harris. Um, and the idea was to show, try to simulate, what would the sky look like? And imagine a sky filled with stars, lots of pretty bright ones. You'd actually have a hard time seeing galaxies and things far, far away because you have so many other stars there. So it'd be a completely different view than what we see in our own little cul-de-sac in the, in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, where do these things actually live? Well, most globular clusters live in the outer suburbs of galaxies, okay? This is, a, this is a, uh, an illustration of our Milky Way galaxy, which is a spiral galaxy that looks a lot like the galaxy M83 that Howard showed you. Okay, so we live in this spiral galaxy and the sun is about halfway out from the center. And these globular clusters live in the halos of galaxies. So again, the outer suburbs. And our Milky Way has about 180 of these clusters total. Okay, most of them are pretty dim and you would have a hard time finding them 
even with a medium-sized telescope, but quite a few of them are bright enough that you, again, if you have access to a small telescope, uh, you can get a good look at some of these. There's another really bright one in the summertime called M22 in Sagittarius, which is also another really nice one to go looking for. And by look, these are sort of our ways of looking at the halos of galaxies, because they tell us interesting things as well, because again, these halos have old stars that formed very early on. Now, not all clusters are the same. Some live close to the middle of the galaxy, and some live far, far outside the Milky Way. Uh, I chose this one. This is a beautiful little Hubble picture of a globular cluster that goes by the rather kind of dull name of NGC 2419. And this is a globular cluster that is way in the outskirts of the halo. It's still bound to the Milky Way. And it's, it's in the top three for social distancing in star clusters. Okay, many globular clusters that you see the nice pictures of are 20, 30, 40,000 light years away from us. This one is 290,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way. So far, far out there. And again, by studying things, we understand just how far out our galaxy actually goes when we see objects like this. Now, one of the things that we also do is we also look at the globular clusters that live in other galaxies. And the Milky Way is a fairly big spiral galaxy, but it only has 180 globular clusters around it. This is a, another image of M87. This is the biggest galaxy in our, our, our area of the universe. This is a giant elliptical galaxy located 55 million light years away. Uh, Howard showed another image of it in his talk. And this is an example of a really big elliptical. It may not look like much because it doesn't have the really nice spiral arms, but this galaxy probably has 10 times as many stars as the Milky Way. So this is a big galaxy. Well, this type of galaxy also has a lot of star clusters around it. And uh, if, if I'm not sure what the resolution is like for people uh, you know, uh, looking in on Facebook, but many of the little dots you see, especially the fainter ones that you can just see in the, in the fuzz in the outskirts of M87 are actually, they're not stars, but they're globular clusters that surround this big galaxy. Um, matter of fact, we think there are over 14,000 of these globular clusters surrounding M87. So not only is it a big galaxy, it has a very massive black hole in the middle, but it has, it has one of the most one of the largest populations of globular clusters, again, in the nearby universe. And then there are dwarf galaxies that maybe have two or three of them. But again, we're able to look at these things and find out what's really going on. We have a very good question. Oh, I'm in. Uh, from Matthew. How okay. do we know how far away these objects are, galaxies and clusters, stars, etc.? Uh, how do we know how far they are from us? And uh, he just said he's curious how these measurements are taken, considering that they're so far away. Yeah, well, things like M87, they're close enough. What we often do is we look at objects that are called standard candles. If we know the brightness of something in that galaxy of an object, let's say a bright red giant star, for example, and we know how luminous they are in our galaxy, we can compare the two. If we know how bright it is here, and we know how dim it is out at a certain distance, we know enough about light to be able to calculate how far away that star is. It's like looking at car headlights. If they're really close to you, they look bright. But from far away, they don't look very bright. And it's not because there's anything wrong with the headlights, it's just there's more distance to the car. Well, if we were to calibrate the brightness of the lights that you see when it's close and far away, you could actually figure out how far away that car is. So we use stars in this galaxy that are just like the ones in our own galaxy. So that's how we know, for example, this galaxy is 55 million light years away. So we use techniques like this to get distances. So it's an excellent question. There's an entire part of astrophysics which is trying to understand just how far away these things are. Uh, and just as a slight nod to some of the research that we do at YSU, because again, I've been looking at globular clusters for all of my research career. Um, we can see ones not only in our galaxy, but we can get closer up looks at ones that are a little further away. 
Uh, for example, uh, at the top right is a Hubble picture of the galaxy M101, which is another beautiful spiral galaxy. And we took data with the Hubble telescope, and here's a globular cluster located 22 million light years away. And how do we know? We can measure the brightnesses of some of these stars in the outskirts, because the brightest stars in a globular cluster are what are called red giants. And we know how bright a red giant is in the Milky Way, so we just have to compare the Milky Way stars to the dim things on this Hubble image, and we can get a distance. And that's how I can tell you with some level of confidence that this thing is 22 million light years away. We can even go further. Now this, you might go, wow, this doesn't look like much. But this is what a globular cluster would look like is if you move it to 55 million light years away. Okay, so a full, you know, uh, a couple of times further away than the last one. So even with Hubble, you have a hard time, but you can see some of the stars in the outskirts. And again, we're able to, this is from a study we did about 13 years ago, and you can still see some of the outline of these star clusters. Now, you can actually find them even further away, but they don't look like globular clusters, they look like dots. Uh, this is the same image that Howard showed you of the Perseus cluster. This is a, a wide field color image from the Sloan Digitized Sky Survey. And what we did is we took uh, 30 images with the Hubble telescope over the last two years. And what we are doing is looking for various objects. We're studying the galaxies in the Hubble images. We're looking for the ultra compact dwarfs. That's what Howard is doing. And I'm looking for the globular clusters. Now this cluster, these galaxies are 250 million light years away. So much, much further away. Okay, this is a full 100 times further away than the Andromeda galaxy. And their globular clusters look like dots. And much as Howard brought up, it's sort of like looking for a needle in a haystack. We have to sort of tell by looking at different filters whether something is a star in the Milky Way, which is interesting, but not for us. They're in the way. And it's really hard to get a star to move. Uh, like this one over here. Yeah, those are in the way. Okay. There are faint fuzzy galaxies in here. And then the things in the circles, and let's face it, the circle is one of the greatest discoveries in astrophysics, uh, are little globular clusters that live outside of the main galaxy. So with Hubble, we're able to push things out to quite large distances. And we use the same techniques that were brought up in that question. So a lot of things that we're able to learn about these things, about how galaxies form and evolve. And I just want to end off on a neat note, because one thing I have to do when I give a talk is try and introduce something completely new, something from the recent research. This isn't research that I do, but uh, one of the things people are studying is, did all the globular clusters in our galaxy actually form with the Milky Way, or were they part of little dwarf galaxies that got absorbed by the Milky Way? And in the last couple of years, we're finding out that perhaps up to half of that 180 globular clusters I told you about the Milky Way didn't form here. They're actually born in dwarf galaxies that, as I say here, got devoured by the Milky Way billions of years ago. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first picture I showed you was M54. It's a globular you can see in a small telescope, and it's actually the core of a little galaxy that is still getting slowly ripped apart and it's becoming part of the Milky Way halo. So some of the objects that are out there came from a ways. So we're learning more and more about our galaxy, about these star clusters, even to this day. We're never finished in science and we're always learning new things. So with that and this color image of M80, uh, thank you for tuning in and I will turn it back to Tiffany for some final words, and if there's any questions. Thank you, Pat. Uh, wonderful talk, uh, as always. Thank you all so much for, for tuning in this week. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to continue to do these every week, every Saturday at 8 p.m. And next week, our show is to the moon and beyond. So we'll be focusing on space exploration, uh, including our past missions to the moon and, and where we hope to head to next. Um, so I hope to see you then, but in the meantime, uh, keep looking up.
Okay.